guard on the tens of thousands of refugees who've crossed from Kosovo. The country says it can take no more. In this sprawling camp of more than 65,000 people, there is a growing sense of panic and chaos, not least among the Macedonian security forces imposing order at times with a stern hand. Go. The targets include uh, things like uh, an oil refinery at uh, Novi Sad, uh, one of the targets on the list tonight, part of the campaign of NATO to cut off the, the supply lines that fuel the Yugoslav army. But these strikes tonight come as the Pentagon admits that uh, the NATO airstrikes have not uh, fulfill the goal of deterring the Yugoslav army, now the attention will have to be turned to destroying it. The clear skies over Yugoslavia allowed laser-guided bombs to hit targets like this bridge that until now could only be attacked with satellite-guided missiles. A full range of NATO planes carried out strikes on roughly two dozen targets, including American B-2s, B-1s, F-117s, F-15s, and F-16s, as well as British tornadoes. Clearly last night was a substantial... ...armed aircraft to use against Serb ground forces. It's designed as a tank killer. Uh, it carries uh, 16 of the Hellfire missiles, which are uh, specifically uh, designed for uh, taking on heavy armored targets. In addition to Hellfire laser-guided missiles, the Apache is armed with two 30-millimeter cannons capable of firing more than 600 rounds per minute. It cruises at 189 miles an hour. Apaches debuted in 1989 during U.S. military action in Panama. They attacked Iraqi radar sites during the first wave of Operation Desert Storm. Apaches have also been used during NATO peacekeeping operations in Bosnia. Their use in Kosovo brings the Apaches close to the terrain they were built for. Apaches were designed during the Cold War for possible use in Eastern Europe against Soviet forces and the Warsaw Pact. The rugged, mountainous terrain of Yugoslavia is, uh, is as I say, ideal because uh, they're, they're designed to fly and hide uh, in certain nooks and crannies or various areas wherever they can, they can get in a little valley. The Apache's biggest advantage, its ability to fly in most kinds of weather and at night. Pilots use infrared and night vision equipment to navigate and target, but it's an advantage that's been known to backfire. During Desert Storm, Apaches were involved in several friendly fire incidents. They misidentified some targets. Um, when you're operating, when you're using FLIR or night vision goggles and these kinds of uh, sight uh, equipment, essentially you can't, you're never 100% sure whether or not what you're seeing is a friend or foe. Built by McDonnell Douglas, now a part of Boeing, each Apache costs just under $15 million. Despite their comparatively low price tag, Apaches are high maintenance aircraft. They go through spare parts quick. And we're cutting. Novi Sad has been hit consecutively for the past three nights, as indeed is Belgrade. Belgrade just reports, our CNN staff there report another big strike against the Yugoslav capital. Uh, I can say that uh, today's activity, or rather tonight's activity, seems to coincide with a clearing of the weather. It is a clear uh, night here down in southern Serbia where I am now. It's quite clear to see some of the explosions uh, that were taking place in Nish, Yugoslavia's third largest city, and uh, Serbian television, as you point out, Bettina, continues to show considerable amounts of collateral damage and damage to infrastructure, bridges, roads, transport, NATO clearly going after uh, supply lines uh, throughout Yugoslavia. So certainly uh, an increased level, it would seem, of NATO activity. But here in Alexinat tonight, quite uh, a high degree of sadness at the scale of devastation, they say, that has taken the uh, the casualty toll very high in a civilian area of this southern Serbian town of Aleksinac. Bettina. And Brandwell, of course, we are watching those pictures uh, from Aleksinac. Uh, the people around Yugoslavia in other parts, how have they been affected by these airstrikes? Have their supply lines uh, for civilian life also been affected already as far as you can tell? Well, there are two phases, really. By daytime, people go about their business as best they can. At nighttime, all cities and towns are really devoid of any, of any light at all. People either go to shelters if they're available or they lie low. In terms of what's happening throughout the country as a whole, it's impossible to give an accurate assessment of just how much damage NATO is doing to um, Yugoslav supply lines.
Adler. Since this all began more than a week ago, an international military effort is now underway. NATO countries are deploying troops, helicopters and other resources to assist in the humanitarian crisis. The French army has started to rush in food supplies. Delighted deportees help them off the Changed by the long-awaited better weather over the Balkans. And the step up, the step back has all been pre-coordinated, pre-thought out by the air leaders, and we are on that timeline and can continue until we accomplish our objectives. War then, to a degree, on automatic pilot. In a situation increasingly bewilderingly complex, the air campaign driving the effort to save these people. Still, for all its high-tech dazzle, basic, according to men on the flight line in a day's work. There's nothing really out of the normal for us. The only difference is our, our pilots are, have a little more risk to it, and uh, the, the jets are coming back with, with the bombs, you know, missing. At a main staging area of the conflict over Kosovo, a sense of a mission so far, for the most part, antiseptic. The sense of calm around here for hours at a time at Aviano, especially at night, can, of course, be deceptive. Most of what flies out of here flies into harm's way, and better weather only means more close-in combat, more risk. Still like the calm mountains that ridge Aviano, an airbase that at times seems somehow above it all. 600 support personnel crosses an important threshold for NATO. The low-flying Apaches will go after Serbian troops and tanks on the ground. They'll be protected by ground-based anti-personnel missile batteries and by Bradley fighting vehicles and tanks that will remain in Albania. These are all army weapons used by soldiers in Army Green. Yet the administration stresses their deployment is not the beginning of a ground force for Kosovo. It's a continuation and intensification of the air campaign. Uh, that's something that we are committed to, and this is a, an, an addition to it. It's something that the uh, General uh, Clark, uh, the SAC uh, has requested, and it's something we think is necessary for him to be able to take this uh, uh, battle right into the, uh, uh, the forces on the ground who are doing uh, this uh, horrible ethnic cleansing. Army helicopters part of the air campaign? Some military experts are not so sure. You asked about the uh, 24 Apache helicopters, 2,000 uh, servicemen, Bradley fighting vehicles going in with them. Um, what does that mean? It means ground power. Uh, is it incremental? Yeah. In addition to the Apache helicopter team, NATO is planning to deploy another six to 8,000 troops in Albania to help the refugees, on top of the 12,000 already in Macedonia. If a ground force for Kosovo should be needed, the beginnings of one will be in place nearby. Another thing about the Apaches, while they are considered extremely effective against tanks and ground forces, they are also more vulnerable than high-flying aircraft. They come up fast, attack a target, and then move. Well, that's nice, unless the Yugoslav tanks and armored personnel carriers on the other side of the mountain have surface-to-air missiles, and they have lots of them. We will lose Apaches, I'll tell you. But all of this may take... Alexinets, 3 a.m., the night the war came to a small mining town in Serbia. These were residential streets, not a sign of anything military. The emergency services say they were hit by cruise missiles, which killed five people, injured 30, five seriously. The target, probably a barracks on the outskirts of town, at least a kilometer from here. This is one of the strikes of the spot. There is another one, also totally civilian building, maybe five meters away from uh, first aid unit and uh, hospital. It was just a matter of time before something like this happened, and the time was 9.40 p.m. Three cruise missiles hit the center of town. We're told that two people died in the house behind me. The emergency services have yet to finish checking all the houses. The dead were taken to the morgue, the injured to a hospital in the city of Niche. Men, women, and children were all caught in the blast. Most people had been in the shelters, otherwise there would have been more casualties. They emerged to view the wreckage of the town centre. This man told us he heard the missiles coming in in quick succession, and then in his words, disaster. He was still in a state of shock hours after the bombing. Many buildings were in ruins, and several hundred dwellings were damaged. Immediate first aid was given here, in premises smashed a few minutes earlier, the staff also in shock. 
The people here are absolutely furious. They cannot understand why the town was targeted or how NATO got it so badly wrong. As they cleared up, those questions were asked over and over again. People we talked to in private, away from the police, said the barracks had been empty for two years and that they were nowhere near the centre. Three streets away from where the missiles fell, the shockwaves had blown out most of the windows in the shopping area. This tragedy will be used by the Yugoslav authorities to reinforce public opinion here, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Tim Marshall, Sky News, Alexinets. RAF Harriers targeted Serbian troops in Kosovo today. It was their first strike against ground forces, and the pilots were said to be confident of success. Sky's David Crabtree is at NATO's Gioia del Colle Air Base in southern Italy. The Harrier GR7s left Gioia del Colle Air Base around midnight, each carrying two 1,000-pound paveway laser-guided bombs. For eight frustrating days, they'd been unable to identify their targets, mainly because of bad weather. But in the early hours, they flew deep into Kosovo and destroyed what's been described as a static target. They saw a lot of uh, AAA coming up from the ground, uh, more than they had seen on previous occasions, uh, though none of the aircraft were targeted by either SAMs or by uh, FRY fighters. One aircraft was unable to drop because he couldn't positively identify his target. To avoid the risk of collateral damage, the pilot brought his bombs back. The British Harriers are now involved in a round-the-clock operation, targeting installations as well as mobile units inside Kosovo. A mark, say the RAF, of the versatility of their GR7s. All the Harriers returned safely to base to be made ready for the next mission. David Crabtree, Sky News. An oil depot, uh, an oil depot that uh, NATO says is linked to the Yugoslav military because, of course, uh, that military depends on fuel and diesel oil to uh, conduct its operations. The before and after scenes show the destruction of that oil depot. At the same time, questions raised about the ongoing damage to the economic infrastructure of Yugoslavia. NATO officials also this day striking out very strongly at Slobodan Milosevic, implying, or more than implying, that he will be personally held accountable for the actions of his troops. Now, this is a theme. We don't seem to have that report right away, but uh, just a reminder again that uh, the Yugoslav leadership has called for, a, has declared a unilateral ceasefire um, over the uh, strikes against Yugoslavia. Now we'll go back to that report from Serbian television in which they made that uh, declaration. Uh, during uh, uh, Easter, uh, all the action will unilaterally uh, stop in uh, Kosovo and Metohia regarding the uh, Easter and uh, expecting that this act will be, this gesture will be uh, uh, appreciated as uh, uh, expression of the will of the most uh, population in Kosovo and uh, expecting that the extreme element will refrain from uh, terrorist actions against uh, civilians and uh, authorities. It was immediately dismissed here at the White House and by the NATO allies because it rejects one absolute demand from NATO, that any ceasefire also include permission for a NATO-led peacekeeping force or security force to return to Kosovo with the refugees. Just before the announcement was made on Serbian TV, the president was here at the White House. He said that Mr. Milosevic must meet all of NATO's demands if he hopes to end the bombing. Mr. Milosevic could end it now by withdrawing his military police and paramilitary forces, by accepting the deployment of an international security force to protect not only the Kosovo Albanians, most but not all of whom are Muslims, but also the Serbian minority in Kosovo. Everybody. U.S. officials had predicted there would be such an offer from the Yugoslav government. They say the president and the British Prime Minister Tony Blair worked the phones throughout the weekend, making sure that if such an offer were made, it would not crack NATO solidarity. They say there is no cracks, that the bombing will continue unless Mr. Milosevic meets all of NATO's demands. The biggest one that he objects to, of course, a NATO-led peacekeeping force, security force, going back into Kosovo with those refugees. Frank? Stop. 
the airstrike campaign that's going on at the moment, but no doubt you've been hearing the Yugoslav offer of a ceasefire. You would probably want to stop that campaign on the right terms, I imagine. Well, absolutely. We've, we've been obviously watching the political events unfold this afternoon. My understanding is that uh, NATO at the moment is treating it with some scepticism and clearly we'll continue to watch that and we stand by to contribute to the air campaign should that continue. No change of orders for you yet? Not yet, no. When you go, when you and your uh, detachment uh, are deployed in a campaign like this, I mean, how much do you listen to the political uh, overtones here or do you try to shut that out and concentrate on the job? A, a bit of both really. We, we all monitor the political events as they unfold with interest because we don't work in a vacuum but clearly our role is actually to to be ready to fly aircraft, uh, fly sorties and actually conduct the operations as required so we very much concentrate on that and that's what we're focused on here. How has your last 24 hours or so been? Uh, it's not, not been too bad. It's been a period of frustration in the last week where the weather's been uh, hampering operations. Clearly things were successful last night. Uh, some successful sorties this morning as well. And overall the, the morale of the detachment's pretty good. Um, and we're here to, to continue as required. No doubt, as well as uh, listening and uh, watching what's happening and politically, you must also see those pictures like the rest of us do of the refugees coming out of Kosovo. They must have an impact even on tough old pilots, don't they? Absolutely. Um, it's only natural that when we see these things that uh, we feel that we'd like to contribute to do something about it. And our job is to stand by uh, to conduct those air operations if required. So exploded. A night that brought the air war into the middle of a small town called Aleksinac in southern Serbia. NATO warplanes roared overhead. The same noise they said they heard just before explosions ripped through the town centre, plunging them into darkness. Confusion and panic was reported as fires broke out. Survivors said they scrambled through debris, including a teacher and her family. It's completely inhuman, she says. I can't describe it. I saved my children. I can only hope we'll be okay. A man stares in disbelief at his own misfortune and that of his neighbours, their high-rise building ablaze. Firefighters douse the flames of Serbian homes, now abandoned. Close by, the scene of one of two direct hits in the town, an almost unrecognisable ruin with obvious signs of recent life. The two-storey dwellings were known as property numbers 56 and 58. They thought they had found all the victims, but death was still apparent. This policeman radios in the discovery of another body. There is anger and there is bewilderment here. The point of detonation is sandwiched between a block of apartments on one side and a clinic on the other. An ambulance parked in the street, while inside, windows and corridors strewn with shattered glass and splintered wood. Four bodies were in the hospital morgue, pulled from rubble, say officials, in what they describe as the worst civilian casualties since the start of NATO's attacks. But why? There's a military barracks about half a mile away, he says, maybe more. But why hit us? We're not a target. They could find no answers to that on this night of heavy NATO strikes when Serbs here felt suffering and pain. Brent Sadler, CNN, Aleksinac, Yugoslavia. It is a closed operational base. It's NATO's uh, biggest uh, airfield involved in this operation. And as such, we are not allowed beyond the perimeter fence. All I can say is that with uh, a little under half an hour to go before that, uh, the Serbian unilateral ceasefire comes into effect, there is no indication here at the end of the main runway uh, that there will be any change in what has been uh, the operational picture here, uh, certainly for the last two days when clearing skies uh, have allowed NATO's warplanes to fly day and night. Uh, this time of evening is about when uh, the main uh, early evening offensive gets underway and uh, at this time yesterday uh, we were seeing warplanes uh, taking off uh, within